in in fixed parameter tractable algorithms. So uh, fifteen. And today we are going to talk about um, second order monadic logic of um, and of course we are talking about it in the context of three reads and um, what I'm going to do I'm going to state a, a pretty amazing theorem about um, certain logical formula and when they are uh, not only the computable, but in fact you can um, compute them in in linear time on a graph that has bounded three width. So this is a pretty surprising result. It's a pretty deep result. So I'm just going to state the result uh, without, uh, you know, uh, without proving it because the proof, the, the book does not provide the proof. And I think it's probably because it, it requires uh, a real trip into logic, which, you know, nobody really wants to do that. Okay, so what is the game about? The game is about writing formulas, you know, formulas with quantifiers. So formula with, they're going to have variables and quantifiers. And quantifiers. What kind of quantifiers? Well, um, so for all exist and for all, okay? And for our purposes, we are allowing you to use, you know, as many of them as you want, right? So this is not one of those cases where you restrict the, uh, you know, the number or order of the, uh, of the, of the quantifiers. Okay, now the, the object we are going to, to work on are graphs, right? So think about that. I give you a graph, right? And we would like to, you know, write uh, some kind of a, a logical formula on, you know, on the graph, right? For example, um, you know, the graph is connected or stuff like that. Right now, the, the real question is, of course, um, what do I allow you to, you know, to write, you know, to write about this graph, right? So, if I allow you variables, so it's natural to to say that variables should be variables should be vertices, right? You want to say look on a specific vertex. You want to look on edges. Right, and here's when things get uh, more interesting. You would like to look on set of vertices, sets of vertices, and sets of edges. Okay, and that's all you're allowed in this logic, right? So you're not allowed to do things like uh, you know. Uh, more general stuff, like for example, a function, right? You can, you know, you can think about a function as uh, uh, a mapping of sets to values, right? There's a lot of other entities we can define, but in the formulas we're going to write, we're going to allow to use only those kind of uh, entities on this given graph, right? Okay, so what kind of formulas can we write? Right, so a natural formula, for example, would be to say, you know, uh, a set X is connected, right? How do you write, you know, Boolean formula, you know, logic formula logic formula for a set is connected, for a set X which is a subset of the vertices that say, 
is connected. Okay, so to this end, I'm just going to write down the, the formula. And as I write it, we will see what maybe is missing. So connected of x, right, is going to be, so x is a subset of the vertices. And we want to know, you know, is x connected? Uh, right, so more formally, is the subgraph induced on x is connected. Okay, um, so let's copy down the formula. Uh, let me use red. <laughs> and this formula looks very strange, right? It took me, it took me quite a bit of time to kind of uh, decipher what is being said by this formula. So for every subset y of the vertices, and now we're going to encounter the regular problem with full logic, which is, you know, you get these things which are very long and very complicated. Uh, Right, so there exists X in capital X, right? Uh, oops, I meant U, or at least the book uses U, U in X, such that U is in Y. You know, to begin with, it's not clear why are we looking on sets Y, right? But we're looking on a set Y such that there is a vertex in X that is in U. Uh, and there exists another vertex, there exists another vertex V in X, right? Such that V is not in Y. I mean, this is like great. Okay. So, so essentially it says that there are two vertices in X, one in Y, one is not in Y, right? And what we want to say is that if this happens, then there must be an edge uh, that belongs to X, such that uh, one endpoint of it is in Y and the other one is not in Y, right? So let's just write it. There exists an edge, in the edges of the graph, and there exists a vertex U, um, in X, and there exists a vertex, um, in fact, I'm not sure why they are plug, uh, fine, I don't, I'm not sure why they, the you know uh while well, they're overloading this uh, notation but okay there exists a vertex v also in x such that you know um uh, well e is equal to uv right so this needs to be translated, and we will go get into this translation later on, because in fact, you need to write it in the right way. Um, and U is in Y, and V is not in Y. Okay, so this is the formula. And that's it. We close the bread bracket. Now, I promised you to translate this uh, equality. So this is really uh, that we have a primitive uh, of this logic that says that 
uh, incidence, right? So incidence u to e means that the edge e is incidence to u, right? It's one of its endpoint, and incident uh, incident v to e. Okay, so this is really equivalent to this. E is equal to the edge, right? But for our purposes, we can just assume that we have this primitive uh, function, incidence, that tell us what is this. Okay, so this is the formula. Of course, um, if you have the same uh, response I had when I read this formula, you're like, okay, what the hell is going on, right? So, so let me tell you what's going on. Why is this formula indeed correct? Why is it indeed true if the set X is indeed uh, connect, connected in the induced graph, right? The, the graph induced over X is in this connected. So the trick is to, to think about X. We have the set X, okay? And now think about the set Y not as a set, but think about it as a cut, right? So Y defines two sets, Y and of course, the complement set, not of y, right? And, and so essentially, y and not of y defines a cut, right? They define all the edges that goes between y and the complement, right? And this cut, the first part of the formula says that this cut y is interesting. Why is it interesting? Well, it's interesting because we have a vertex uh, of x that belongs to y, and we have another vertex of x that belongs to the other side, right? Okay, so this this set, this cut y indeed cuts x, right? But the set x is going to be connected only if the, uh, uh, it has at least one edge in this cut, right? X must have at least one edge in this cut, otherwise it would be disconnected by this cut. Right. In fact, this is if and only if a set is connected or a graph is connected if for any non-trivial cuts uh, there is an edge in the cut. Right. So that's all the what the second you know the second part of the formula says, you know, this is an interesting cut. This okay, so this part says this is an interesting cut. And the second part says, uh, and the second part says, this cut indeed contains an edge of x. And uh, and the, the glue between the two parts is implies, right? If it's an interesting cut, then there must be uh, an edge in the cut that belongs to x. And that's all that this formula says, and then such is indeed true. If it if this formula is true, then the set X is connected, right? Okay. Um, so now, right, so now we can, uh, uh, you know, we can, and of course you can write more and more general, uh, more general formulas, right? You can write, and we will see it, you can write formulas like, uh, you know, we have an Hamiltonian, uh, a set of edges forms, a Hamiltonian cycle or Hamiltonian path, right? Um, so you can write down uh, uh, formulas, right, for NP-complete problems, right? Whether or not there is a Hamiltonian cycle is a is a an NP-complete uh, a problem, and as such, if I ask you, given a formula and a graph, I ask you is the formula is correct for this graph? I'm essentially asking you is there a Hamiltonian cycle in the graph, right? Now we already know because we played with similar example earlier that this problem is is can be solved in linear time for you know the Hamiltonian cycle. But the nice thing about logic is that it says that you can you know you can write this you can write this uh, any formula you want as long as you stay inside the logic, right? So the the critical thing about all this logic uh, stuff is that there are very strict rules what you're allowed to do. And as long as you comply with them, uh, you are staying inside the logic and you get whatever you can do with this logic. Okay. So, um, 
So maybe it would be best if I stop now for this part. Okay, by the way, I should say maybe before I, I uh, move on that uh, this kind of logic is written as uh, MSO2, monadic second order uh, logic. I don't know why uh, the second order and so on, but it's MSO2. And the two is because we're allowed to essentially work on singleton, which are vertices and edges, which are, are, are pairs. And this is why the two comes in. Um, and, um, and you know, you know, I should say that, you know, in all this logic stuff, the basic problem is that uh, if you have a logic which is too expressive, then uh, you immediately get, uh, in particular, if your logic is enough to uh, include the, the integer number and basic operation on integer numbers, then uh, getting incompleteness theorem says that it's incomplete, right? You know, uh, uh, essentially, the way to think about uh, logical incompleteness is that, um, you know, um, maybe the simplest thing is to think about undecidability, right? There, there are things that you can write in this logic which you cannot decide whether they are true or not, right? Getting incompleteness theorem, in fact, is deeper. It says that uh, there is infinite number of statements such that you either have to take the statements as correct or incorrect as an axiom in your logic system, right? Uh, another way of saying it is that uh, any axiomatic system that cover all the integer numbers, the you know integer number and basic operation, the integer numbers requires uh, infinite description. There is no finite description of uh, uh, integer arithmetic, which is you know kind of mind-boggling. Right, and the proof, by the way, first it predates uh, uh, Turing uh, halting theorem proof uh, by I think like eight years or something like that, or ten years, and um, it uses the same degradation argument. So in fact, if you saw one proof, you can understand the other, but the other one is is much more, uh, you know the. The Gödel incompleteness requires much more work than the halting theorem. And now, of course, um, so let's create a problem, right? It says that you cannot create logic that are too expressive. And what people um, in formal methods uh, and logic do, as far as I understand them, they are trying to come up with logic systems that are uh, as expressive as possible, while it's still possible to do interesting stuff with those logic. Right. Um, so we know that, uh, for example, you know, um, there are a lot of things that, you know, NP-complete problems or NP-hard problems that you can write as uh, a logic formula on general graphs, right? Uh, do you have a clique? It's a very easy to write a formula. In fact, uh, if you think about it, when we write uh, a verifier for an NP-complete problem, what we really do at some level is we write a Boolean formula which is satisfied if and only if uh, the formula, you know, the, this Boolean formula can be satisfied, right? This is essentially what Cook's theorem was about, right? Cook's theorem proved that uh, all the NP, you know, that SAT is universal, essentially said that all the NP complete problems can be converted into a formula, such a formula is, is a satisfying assignment if and only if the original instance of the yes answer, right? Um, so, so in some sense, this result on uh, MSO2 and the fact that we can uh, resolve such logic formulas in linear time is quite interesting and, and surprising. It's a very strong result. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say in this part, and we will continue later on.